Well, welcome back, and I am so happy. Look, everybody came back. <laughs> it's scary when you say there's an hour lunch break. Um, thank you for coming back. Um, after our first part of the afternoon, we'll have a 15 minute break. And during that 15 minute break, I am assured coffee and tea and snacks, which is also my way of saying sugar and caffeine. <laughs> I want to um, just take a moment. You know, we, we have an environmental safety officer now here at uh, Green River College. Most of you have met Maggie. Maggie, where's you, where, are you, where are you? Give a wave. All right. All right. Yeah. A hiring process that some people were skeptical as to whether it would ever occur at this college. Just want to say for the record. Anyway, um, but one of the things you've noticed, um, I think, since Maggie's arrival is that I think it's fantastic. She's been sending out uh, safety newsletters, right, environmental safety newsletters via the email. Um, but as you know, I do call it e-jail. Uh, we, we have a lot of email. Um, and she wondered if I could just make a little plug for things that are happening, because as you said, safety rocks, right? Um, but in case you didn't have a chance today, you know, during the break, uh, Maggie did set up a little bit of a booth uh, for information out here in our lobby area. So please, if you have a chance, swing past there during the break and see what's happening in terms of our environmental safety. All right. So, um, Everybody, how about we do this? So as we're all sitting here, we had a, a really powerful morning with Sarah. I'm happy to tell you that Sarah did make it to the airport. <laughs> I was so nervous about this. We tried to get her to change her air flight. I'm like, I'm worried. Like, I'm TSA pre-check. I don't check a bag. We'll be fine. I'm like, <gasps> um, and her flight won't leave for another 20 minutes. So, all right. So, <laughs> mission accomplished with that. When Tanya comes back, we'll have to thank her for getting there. And I did say to Tanya I'd pay her uh, speeding tickets if she got some. <laughs> but I think it was, such a, it was such a powerful morning. I don't know about you, but I sat through, the, through t listening to her and, and having her share information, and my mind was just flooded with ideas and, and insights and sort of aha moments. And I loved that question that came from the floor. I don't know which one of you wrote that question, but it was about how, how do we get involved? How do, what do we do next? Um, and that's kind of how I felt as well, uh, among other things. Also recognizing what an opportunity we have as a college. What an opportunity. And I'm so grateful that we are participating in the HOPE survey this year. So this afternoon, as we begin, Maybe what we can do is just take a moment and uh, take a deep breath and release it. Try to sense the feeling in your neck and shoulders. And in the next deep breath, um, as you breathe in, sort of raise your shoulders up. And as you exhale, be conscious and let your shoulders down. So let's do that. Excellent. Wanted to introduce a couple of new arrivals for this afternoon as well. Um, with us now, we have Chuck Folson, who joined us, our former board chair of the foundation. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. And I'm especially pleased that Representative Deborah Entman has joined us for the afternoon. <laughs> Representative Entman. For those who, of you who might not know, she was very involved with our workforce education bill, House Bill 2158, that not only fully funded our salaries for staff and faculty, um, in addition uh, to the King County 5% differential, but has also been an extraordinarily strong advocate for student emergency aid of all kinds. So I am so grateful for you to be here today. Um, people commented during lunch that it was really great that we're having our K-12 partners here and legislative and elected partners. We are the village. Together we are stronger. Together we can make things happen. And also out of the corner of my eye, I just noticed we have John Holman, who's also joined us this afternoon, um, part of our foundation, also City Council of Auburn. Okay, so this is my 
my point when I'm supposed to tea Russell Lowry Hart, uh, my, my dear friend, um, onto the stage, I am so unbelievably proud and honored to be able to have him here with us today. Russell and I met back in 2016-17. Uh, we were both members of the inaugural cohort of the Aspen Presidential Fellowship. And uh, it was a year's journey. And when we met first um, at our first uh, residential session, I just knew um, he was going to be somebody I was going to know for the rest of my life. Didn't know if I'd be a president. Didn't know if I wanted to be a president. He had just finished, I believe, your second, your second year as a president. And so new presidents were eligible as well. And I learned so much from him that year. And if I've gotten anything right in the two years I've been with you, um, it's because I learned from him. Um, <laughs> no, I was going to own the bad. I was going to own the wrong. Um, but I'm so pleased to have him here today. And he's going to be talking to us about two things, I think, predominantly. One, I wanted him to share the story that he is living and experiencing at Amarillo um, as the president. And what has happened at their college as a culture and as a culture of caring? Sarah spoke about a culture of caring um, this morning. And so I think he's going to bring that to life in a real way, in a college story way of Amarillo. But we're not Amarillo and we're not Texas. But there are things about the story that I think resonate with so many, will resonate with so many of us in this room. Because it's the same things I know we feel and try to live each day here, and that we're trying to actualize. The other thing that he's going to have us do, um, and you'll notice at your tables during lunchtime, the, the lunchtime uh, elves came, and they've deposited some new information to you on the table, um, which will come in handy later on. But we're going to be doing some work. He's going to lead us through some work related to Green River College students, which I think you'll find um, illuminating and also moving. So with that, okay, this is the magic wand, right? <laughs> there we go. Um, so what does it mean for us as Green River College to have a culture of caring? When I think about that, and we've talked about this, for quite a time since we did our climate survey. It means many important things to us internally as a college because we are the culture that students come in and out of every day. So a culture of caring means it's something that we demonstrate and we experience with each other each day that we can also demonstrate to the students so they experience it each day. It's both of those things. It is both of those things. And expressed in our core values. Now, on your, on your tables, there's a handout, big, green, glossy, mission, vision, and our core values. Not to be confused, if you wants me to say, not to be confused with our core themes. Our core values. Now, if some of you are wondering, where did those come from? Those are the ones that are in our current strategic plan. These are the core values back in 2012-13 when that strategic plan was being written. This college determined to be their guiding principles and values of how you go about doing your work. In this year, our broader question will be, are these the values we move forward with? Do we modify them? Do we revise them? Do we write new ones? So that will be a question for us. But today, we're going to be working from the ones we have. I said this at the last town hall of last year when we were talking about integrated governance and planning at this institution and how we came to know that we had a lack of knowledge and understanding about our own culture that we've created. And I, I made the point with all of us, which I know we all agree with. Our, stu our students need all of us, not just some of us. We collectively are the solution 
and hold all the resources our students need, not just one area or another. When you think about students that go to highly selective, elite institutions, it's not that they don't have their personal struggles and so on, but they have so many other resources available to them. We are a college of opportunity for all. What does that mean? It has to mean more than you can walk through our doors. We're trying to find ways for every student who walks through our doors to go through us to the next step in their life. We are part of their journey, and they've chosen us. They need all of us. So when we talk about a culture of caring, it means every single one of us brings something to that success. And that's the other element that Russell's going to be talking with us today about. So, it is my honor to introduce to you President Russell Lowry Hart of Amarillo College. He was named president of Amarillo College in 2014 um, and has received the 2019 Leah Meyer Austin Award as one of the top student success institutions in the Achieving the Dream Network. Amarillo, Co Amarillo College's work on poverty was featured in The Atlantic in June 2018. I think I sent that link to all of you in prior emails. Russell's leadership is focused on improving student success through systematic and cultural change by empowering the student voice in redesigning higher education. While his calling is education reform, his passion is his family. His wife, Tara, sons, Christopher and Campbell, daughter, Cadence, fill his life with beauty and joy. And I'm going to probably take a little piece of thunder, but I, his son, Christopher, was Musafa in Lion King on Broadway. Two weeks ago. I'll let him give you the details, but with no further ado, Russell Lowry Hart. So my son has been an actor for 20 years, is in the national tour of Lion King as Mufasa. And um, I, I was talking to Montgomery College in Maryland, and I got 911 texts from my son, which usually means what when your kids need you? Money. Money. Um, and instead it was, I just found out they're calling me up to Broadway. I've got to be there in two days. I'm going to be on the stage in three days. Uh, and so my son, who's been a working actor for 20 years and incredibly talented, um, and I think a true success story for community colleges, was Mufasa on Broadway. And that was an amazing experience for us. So I'm, I'm honored to be here, um, and I think I, I deserve your sympathy. No one should have to follow Sarah Goldrick, Rob, and lunch. Um, She's an amazing visionary, and I think you're lucky to have her on your campus. And, and I hope that when you receive your data from her, it is a catalyst uh, for you in the same way it was for Amarillo College. So I'm going to share the Amarillo College story with you, but with a caveat. It's our story. It's not your story. I'm not asking you to hear our story as if you should make our story your story. We haven't figured it out either. We've just made progress. Um, we're both co-actors in this space of trying to reimagine what we're supposed to be in an environment, both politically and culturally and socially, that doesn't know how to take the students that we have and get them to a, a certificate or a degree or transfer uh, in the ways that our communities demanded of us uh, to, to survive. So at Amarillo College, our transformation started uh, with this question right here. What would happen if, so I'm gonna ask you the same question. What would happen if we listed on the board all the reasons why our students fail? And let's list them, call them out. Why do students fail? Be honest with each other. I'm not looking for the, the politically correct answer. I'm looking for all the reasons when we're sitting around coffee talking about why students fail, why they really fail. They don't come. 
They don't come prepared. Those high schools don't prepare them to be successful. Say again. They don't connect with us. Lack of resources. Say again. Say it louder. Say it e louder. Stand up and say it. Stand up and say it. Because this is a big one. This is a big one, right? They can't add. Right. So this is, this is what we did at Amarillo College. We went through an exercise and we listed all the reasons why our students were failing. And we had like 42 different reasons why students fail. They're not serious. They don't know how to study. Um, they have real challenges. Their families don't support them. Um, they don't know how to add. The high schools aren't preparing them. They don't know how to write. They're not reading enough. They're on their phones all the time. Legitimate issues, right? What was missing from our list? We did not think that we had one ounce of control over why students were failing. We weren't on the list. All the reasons why students were failing at Amarillo College were because of them. And if they would just do what we said they should do, then we would be more successful too. It was a, it was a real moment of honesty. Um, and so this was what happened. We realized that we hadn't taken any onus for our students' failure. We looked at who our students were, what they needed from us. We listened to our community, our employers, our transfer partners, families, uh, churches, social service agencies. We had a six month process of listening. And what we came back with is that it does not matter at all what our students are and are not doing if we can't see ourselves as having any influence on the list. So at Amarillo College, we adopted a no excuses philosophy. And here's what it means. It was created by an elementary school principal at Lost Penn in San Diego, California. And I don't, you, you're probably more familiar with the California system than most, um, but they rank all of their schools from first to last based on test scores. And guess where Lost Penn was when Damon Lopez took over? They were in the bottom 10, not bottom 10%, the bottom 10. Three years later, they were in the top five. 15 years later, they're still in the top 10. And that transformation happened not with blaming students for their failure, not with blaming politicians, not with blaming parents, not with blaming society or technology. It happened from a simple shift in philosophy, a no excuses philosophy. But instead of inflicting a pull yourself up by the bootstraps metaphor on our students that's been historically destructive, he asked his faculty and staff to take onus that when a student fails, it's because they didn't have the right person, policy, or process in place to ensure their success. So at Amarillo College, we adopted the no excuses uh, philosophy. It's, a, it's a, a system. There are no excuses. University is a nationwide movement now that has almost a million students uh, uh, involved in it. We were the first higher ed partner. But fundamentally what it meant is we could look at all of those reasons on the board all of the things that our faculty and staff were talking about when they would get together for coffee or dinner to complain about our students. We looked at all of those things on the board, which were legitimate, and we decided that we were going to have to take responsibility for them. So if a student doesn't know math and can't add, guess what? It doesn't matter whose fault it is. As an institution, we had to step up and say, we're gonna find the solution. If they can't study, we've got to figure out how to help them study. If they can't get to us, we've got to help figure out how to get them to us. We are the ones that can't have excuses. And our communities can't afford for us to swim in and walk in the excuses that higher ed has, been, has embraced and not held but accountable for for decades. 
We are in a system that I think isn't necessarily working effectively for all of the citizens in our communities. But what I know from knowing Suzanne and what I know from talking with many of you already and what I know from the four students that I did a secret focus group with this morning is that you have the makings of doing something truly magical just with a simple shift of instead of blaming the students, taking responsibility for them. And here's the issue. Are you satisfied with where you are right now? Kay McClinney, um, who is a, a researcher of community colleges and higher education, said this. Every policy, every process, every school is perfectly designed to produce the exact results it's currently getting. When you look at your success rates as an institution, you are perfectly designed to produce them. Are you satisfied with where they are? And if you're not, and even if they're good, let's not be satisfied with just being good when our communities demand us to be great. If you're not satisfied, we can no longer look at reform as simply playing in the margins of, poli of polishing and perfecting policies and processes and procedures that aren't effective already. So reform in higher education, I'm sorry, y'all getting a Russell sermon, so just buckle up. <laughs> higher education reform is satisfied with 1% increase in student success, and we celebrate and we get awards over it. But our communities are dying, and we're the epicenter of saving them. We can no longer afford to protect what was. We have to reimagine what could be. And I know you're sitting there going, why is this old fat white guy from Amarillo standing in, um, in your auditorium talking to you about uh, the Amarillo College story? And the bottom line is um, our communities are really similar. They're struggling in poverty, drowning in poverty, uh, struggling with a low education attainment rate. Um, Amarillo has the highest refugee per capita than any city in the country. You want to know how that happened? It wasn't because I was the president of the college and we were going to take care of our, our refugees. It was because Catholic Family Services is made Amarillo a refugee settle, settlement. And when they give a list of places and refugee camps that refugees can move to, often refugees that don't speak English. The list is alphabetical, and guess who was first? <laughs> but I would have been a part of a community 15, 10 years ago that would have had that experience, and we would have had lots of dinner parties complaining about it. But now I live in a community that sees it, and instead of complaining, instead of deflecting, has figured out how do we fix it? How do we solve? How do we serve? How do we love these uh, new neighbors to success? So we're in different parts of the world, um, but our communities are more similar uh, than you might think. The part of the success at Amarillo College has come with that no excuses philosophy, and the foundation of that philosophy is a culture of caring, and that's what we're going to spend uh, the next few moments really diving into and talking about. What is the culture of caring? How does it work? Uh, and why is it so important? And I'm going to tell you, when you look at the students that you have on your, the composites that are on your tables, and you dive into who those students are, they need caring from you more than just about any barrier they face in their life. Because that you and caring about them is what's going to help them overcome the barriers that they walk on your, uh, your campus with. Fundamentally, when you look at the issues of poverty and you look at issues of underemployment and wage stagnation and a real stratification of wealth, our communities need us differently now than they've ever needed us before. But what they don't need from us, and I'm saying this as a recovering faculty member and an academic at heart, they don't need us 
to double down in protecting a century of traditions that weren't mired in anything other than tradition. They need us to come to the table, willing to place our students and their needs at the center of how we reimagine the work that we do. And this is what our communities need most from us. Well, then a wet kitten and able to get a stranger's attention with a single courtesy. Excuse me? This is America's latest superhero. Don't forget to show love. And the only superhero with the power to feed the homeless. Now, why do you do that? You know what, Mr. C? It's just the right thing to do. Is it? Yes. You want honey? By day, Austin P. Ryan is a mild-mannered four-year-old from Birmingham, Alabama. But about once a week, he turns into this alter ego. Would you like a sandwich? A superhero set on feeding as many homeless people as possible. Thank you. What's your superhero name? President Austin. Uh-huh. President Austin. President Austin. President Austin. That's his idea of what the president is supposed to do. I was like, buddy, you have no idea. <laughs> but hey, I'm going along with it. TJ says this all began when they were watching a TV show about pandas. It showed a mama panda abandoning a baby. TJ told his son the cub was now homeless. He says, what's homeless? I said, well, it's when you don't have a home and sometimes you don't have mom or dad around. I can tell what the follow-up question is going to be. Yeah, are people homeless? When I was a four-year-old, I didn't care about helping people. I did. I see. Once Austin learned some people are homeless and some are even hungry, he launched this caped crusade told his mom and dad that he wanted all his allowance and money they would spend on toys Here you go. to go toward chicken sandwiches instead. Oh, thank you, baby. You're welcome. Don't forget to show up. After he gives out each sandwich, yes. he gives each person that same bit of advice. Don't forget to show love. Don't forget to show love, he tells them. And most do, immediately. Well, thank you. It warms my heart to see you. It'll warm anyone's heart. Yeah, he really did, man. Raymond Boss says this kid gives him hope. That's, that's, that's where it starts. Don't forget to show love. Everyone who meets Austin leaves with hope. Which is why, with any luck, someday President Austin won't be a superhero anymore. Being the homeless is the highlight of my life. He'll just be a president. All right, come on, Austin. Steve Hartman on the road in Birmingham, Alabama. The reform that we have to embrace in higher education is often distracted by the checklist of things that we have to provide, and we have to provide them. But if those things that we're providing, the long list of supports and services that we're providing are not rooted in love, then we are not going to save the communities in which we reside. The work that we're engaging in, the work that I'm asking you to join us in partnering on is really, really personal. The students that come on your path need your heart as much as they need your help. And so at Amarillo College, our reform is really based off this one statement. At Amarillo College, we are going to love the students we have, not the students we used to have or the students we wished we have. But we're going to love the students we have. And as a faculty member myself, I've said in enough meetings where I complained and moaned and groaned about the student we have. And I'm guessing that when my professors uh, were teaching me, they sat in the same uh, coffee house and complained about me. The difference is I had a social support network that could support me and love me to success despite my institution of higher education. And your students are not going to survive separate of you. The only hope they have is that if you take a hold of them, their head and their heart, and you truly love your students to success. That's how critical it is, and that's how personal the work has to be. So I want you to meet um, our typical student. We call her Maria. Maria is smart, she's capable, she's ambitious, but she is dramatically different from the students 
that our processes were set up for 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So she's first generation. You already know the challenges that any first generation college student brings to a campus. Uh, and what worries me the most is that we actually, I think, use our processes of onboarding our applications and our FAFSAs and our getting in to see an advisor and logging on to your class. We use those things as a subtle test to see if you're really serious about being a college student. If you can survive the landmines we put in front of you to onboard, then you might be worth our investment in you. And my challenge to you is when the majority of the students in community colleges across the country are first gen, we're giving them an unannounced pop quiz when they have no context or support to understand the questions that we're asking them. Have you tried to fill out a FAFSA? I have a senior in high school right now. Um, the whole process, she, he has two college educated um, parents, a uh, master's degree and PhD. My whole work has been in higher education. And we went to our first college tour and I was gobsmacked um, about uh, several different things. One, I didn't understand um, some of the processes that our universities were inflicting on our students. I didn't understand some of the language and I live in this culture. Um, the other thing that really bugged me is that I didn't understand that I was going to be completely cut out of my students' experience. And the guise of not helicoptering, we're not inviting our families into the process, especially for our students that need them to be in the process. My son's gonna be okay, but his two best friends who don't have parents that have gone through college are gonna struggle if they have to go through this by themselves. She's part-time. When we started our reformation uh, four and a half years ago, 82% of our students were part-time. Now, I think when we get our final data, this will be the first time the majority of our students are full-time. And it's become the structural changes that we've made. Uh, she's uh, Hispanic uh, with real financial needs. She typically wants to transfer. But here are the key statistics that aren't readily captured on all of our demographic data but are really critical to understanding who your students are. She's 28 years old. This is the typical average student at the college. She's 28 and she's raising 1.2 kids while working two part-time jobs. Think about issues of when the services that we offer our students are available. When are your offices open, typically? Eight to four, nine to five, maybe eight to six. And Maria is probably working one of her two part-time jobs, trying to come to class in the evening or online or taking a class in the morning and then uh, working in the afternoon and the evening. But so often what we've designed for our students is what's convenient for us not necessarily what they need, when they need it, where they need it. So for us, Maria was a really important conversation starter because what we had to acknowledge is that we were set up for and had policies and processes designed around the student we used to have in the 70s and 80s when we were a traditional junior college that was preparing students to go to UT Austin. That ain't who we are anymore. And guess what? That's not who most communities in this country are anymore. We will not survive if we're just trying to take the student that would be successful without us and then cheering ourselves and patting ourselves on the back when they graduate. Know who your student is and why she's so powerful and important and understand what her story is. And I want you to meet one of our Marias. One of my biggest goal in life is to make my parents and my family proud of me. And education is what they think will get me to anything. They want me to be successful and education is always key. So being the first generation, you know, I'm the first generation to go to college. It's, it's an honor and it's, it's a lot of pressure also, but it's really worth it. Um, 
I can't think of anything else that would make me feel more proud because my parents are proud. Um, my parents are immigrants from Vietnam. They came here back in, I think, 1990. Uh, they went to Houston. Um, my parents moved to Amarillo because of a job opportunity. I want to say they did a really good job at raising me and my brothers. Uh, we, our only consider, our goal right now is just to finish college. And, just to make them proud. They don't want us to have the same struggles that they went through. You know, they've worked really, really hard, and we're a middle-class family, just your ordinary family. Um, they didn't have that opportunity. My, I think my dad, he didn't finish middle school. My mom, I think she finished her ninth grade year in high school in Vietnam. And um, that's something that they don't really talk much because they're embarrassed about. And, but they wanted to let me know that that's not what they see for my future. They want the, com the complete opposite. Um, I know for sure, especially at Emerald College, everyone's here to help no matter what. And I feel like as long as first year generation students aren't scared to step out and ask for that help, then that would be a tremendous step into their career, into their college education, you know. And I think as a community, we just need to know that even though as a first year generation student, we need that little help, we need that little push. And that's what's gonna make a difference. That's gonna make a difference between applying to college and walking that stage and getting a degree. My dad is not a big show of his you know, affection. And he, um, I told him, I'm graduating college, you know, and, I think he shed a tear the first time ever, and uh, I'm sorry. Oh, everything, all the, the, didn't have a calculator, all the struggles I went through, that just flipped my whole body. I saw that, I saw his smile, and I made him proud. Mm -hmm. And that, that means everything to me. So, I wanna tell you why, I wanna tell you why her story is so important. Um, Linda graduated in the top 10%, not top 10%, the top 10 of her high school class uh, in Amarillo. Um, she tested college ready. She didn't require any developmental education uh, and immediately moved into um, her first math class. And, and this is coming from someone who just told you a part of her story. And the most powerful part of her story is she says that they're just a typical middle-class family where they're immigrants with neither parent really finished anything beyond the ninth grade. And that's the new reality to live in this country. Middle-class fundamentally means you have a job. It's not about wealth or about income anymore. It's just if you're working. And so um, it's a terrible moniker because I think that it... Um, it gives a false impression of what's happening to a lot of our families. So here is someone who has the whole weight of the world on her shoulders. She's carrying the burden of expectation for her family and her three younger sisters. And she gets in her math class and she gets a hundred on all of her homework and a 98 on one of them. And then gets in her first test, which is taken outside of class in a testing center. And she makes a 33. So the old Amarillo College would have looked at that 33 and we would have thought what we often thought at that time, which is what? She didn't study. She's not serious. She didn't know how to study. Um, she might maybe has test anxiety um, or if we're gonna be honest with each other, someone else must have been doing her homework right? But we also noticed from our data that when, after students took the first test in their math class, the drop rates soared. And so we changed the way we delivered that information. We have a lot of required tutoring that's integrated in all of our gen ed classes uh, with triggers. And so every student gets their first test results back from a tutor rather than online. Why? What would have happened to Linda if she saw that 33 before she saw a person? She would have bolted. The, the tutor gives her the test and says, Linda, 
you're, you, I know you can do this. What happened? And she burst into tears and said, I knew I wasn't smart enough to go to college. Top 10 in her class, her high school class. And so the, the tutor said, well, you didn't finish most of your test. I know you can do this because you've done it on the homework. Work this problem for me. And so she started working the problem for the tutor and the tutor immediately understood what happened. The whole class was designed to be taken with a calculator and Linda wasn't using one. So the tutor said, Linda, why aren't you using the calculator? And she said, what? And it's like, well, it's on your syllabus. So they pulled out the syllabus and it said course materials. It had the textbook and it had TI-84. What does TI-84 mean? Texas Instruments Calculator. She almost failed and would have walked away because we were making assumptions about what she should know before she ever steps foot in a classroom. Did understanding what TI-84 means have any real uh, reflection on her intellect? No, it's about her experiences, but we were holding accountable to those experiences without giving her uh, the resources and support to make up for the lack of them. So Linda got to be in that class. She graduated. Um, we got her a calculator, which at the time was $79 on sale at Walmart. Ridiculous. Um, she graduated with highest honors. She went to the university uh, down the road uh, and just got a 4.0 in her first year at the university. And she would have walked away thinking she wasn't smart enough, not understanding that the barriers that she faced didn't have anything to do with her intellect. It had everything to do with our assumptions. So here's our theory of change at Amarillo College, and this is what we'll spend uh, the rest of our time talking about. Our theory of change is this, that if we can remove at least one life barrier in an accelerated learning environment, the majority of our classes are now in eight-week format, through a deep culture of caring where our students feel seen, heard, and loved, then she'll finish. She'll actually graduate and finish what she started. And these are the three foundational elements to our theory of change. One is that we are going to eradicate student poverty barriers, and we'll talk about the complete system that we put in place uh, to ensure that our students can get their barriers uh, met. Two is an accelerated learning environment, especially for uh, students that are working. Uh, when we noticed from our data that we were losing the majority of our students, it was weeks 10, 11, and 12. So we just eliminated weeks 10, 11, and 12. <laughs> <clears throat> And moving to eight weeks, an accelerated learning environment. Y'all are in quarters? Or, yeah, it's, it's 10 week quarters. I, I love it because um, a student can tell themselves, I can do anything for eight to 10 weeks, but 16 weeks seems almost insurmountable. 16 weeks drains hope and eight weeks, and I think 10 weeks give it. And then the centerpiece of everything is real data analytics and predictive analytics where we can identify the barriers that we stu think our students are gonna have before they have them and connect them to those resources before they're in crisis. Because here's the thing, you can have all the resources in the world, but if the first time your students are engaging with them is when they're in crisis, you've already lost. The minute your students are in crisis, the likelihood of saving them is immensely more difficult than if you can avoid and preempt the crisis altogether. So our Reformation story is about loving the student we have, and then it's about listening to the student we have. And you saw uh, Sarah talk to you this morning. These are the Amarillo College results from the survey that Sarah at the Hope Lab is doing. 59% of my students are housing insecure. 59% of my 10,800 students are housing insecure. 54% of my students are food insecure, and 11% of my students are homeless. You're gonna get your own data in the spring, um, and I hope it's not as, as decimating as this was for me, um, 
But what scared me the most when Sarah shared this data with us is if you look at the ranges, we're not the top of the range. We're not far from it. But there are schools and communities that are struggling more than we are uh, in Amarillo. And so before you think, oh my God, who wants to go to Amarillo? You saw from Sarah this morning, this is an, uh, this, we're not an outlier. This is the norm for community colleges in this country. But it's not the norm for people, for 500 people to gather with each other and spend a day talking about it. I think you should be really proud that your college is willing to acknowledge it, understand it, and find ways to respond to it. So when I saw our success rate data, I was the Vice President of Academic Affairs at Amarillo College. In 2012, uh, I looked at our success rates and I was really, frankly, embarrassed of them. And um, I did what I do by training as a recovering uh, academic. I started doing some research on it, and my research was all about focus groups and interviews. So I did um, 10 focus groups and about uh, 25 follow-up interviews, and then we did survey data. We listened to our students and what they told me. And my whole point of focus grouping and surveying them was to find out what was keeping them from being successful in the classroom. And their answers to my questions fundamentally changed who I am as a person and as a professional. Because the top seven things that my students told me that were keeping them from being successful in the classroom had nothing to do with the classroom. Childcare, healthcare, transportation, food, housing, utility payments, legal services, because we penalize poverty in this country a lot. I went in thinking that we were going to hear answers of my students needed more active learning strategies, which they do, and they, they needed more engaged pedagogy, which they do. Uh, and, and they needed more applied learning, which they do. And my students told me that their biggest barriers to being successful in my classrooms were life barriers that I had not taken responsibility for. So we simply ask our students and then we listened to them. And from that realized with our no excuses philosophy that if our students have barriers, it's not enough to say, well, the community better step up and fix it. I'm not asking my colleagues to be social workers, and I don't think Suzanne's asking you to become social workers. <laughs> but the key is, the key is you've got to find ways to connect your students intentionally to the supports that you have in this community, which are robust. You have a lot of supports for your students, but the misnomer is they know how to access it, and more than that, they know how to game it. And none of those things really prove to be true. So we love the students we have, then we listen to them, and the third thing we did is that we empowered the students we have. So here's what I did. I'm not suggesting you do this at all. Uh, this is just how we managed it. But I did uh, more focus groups that were stu student driven, and I asked students to tell me what the perfect college looked and felt like for them. And what they told me was um, really powerful. The perfect college for our students had two common elements, relationships with faculty, staff, and other students, and something we're loath to talk about in higher education, and that is customer service. The perfect college was about systemic relationships and service, kind of that student experience. So here's what I did. Uh, when I found out that um, relationships and service were foundational to what our students needed for the perfect college, I'm like, let's play, let's try something. I didn't get approval from my board. That was a mistake up front. Um, but I just ask, I ask students to, to go through this process with me, and I use secret shoppers a lot to go through our processes to help me understand what does and doesn't work in the college from a student perspective, not from my perspective. And so through a series of three different meetings, I simply asked students to look at um, a, a list of, of values from companies that they identified as being um, what we would say the best, known for building relationships with their customers and serving them really well. 
that generated a list of 53 values from these companies on a wall. The next meeting was taking those values down to 10 to 15. The third meeting was voting on which values from that list we were gonna actually embrace as our Amarillo College values. So I'm telling you, these are not academic. We don't have things like global learning and um, critical thinking, which are really important. But my challenge to you as you see them is to think about those things are fundamental to what we should be doing in higher education. Our values are how we do that fundamental work. So here are the values that our students identified that are now written into every job description in the college uh, and are a part of all of our evaluations within the college. It's all about caring. Caring through wow. Our students said the perfect college for them they would go, at the end of any interaction with an AC employee, they would go, wow, that person really does care about me. They wanted to be wowed. They wanted to know that we were being innovative and responding to who they were, rather than us always asking them to respond to us. I was overwhelmed, um, really moved, by how much fear our students walk in our presence carrying fear that they're not gonna find their class, fear that they're not gonna fit in, fear that they're not gonna be able to pay. But fear was predominant in their experiences walking on, our, on my campus, and I'm assuming yours as well. And so the perfect college for them was fun. They wanted to know that going to college could be fun rather than fearful. I had one student that told me that she had driven around the college for six months trying to get the courage to park her car and she did, and she went into the advising center at 12.04 and wanted to make an appointment. And they told her, any clue? We're closed for lunch, can we make an appointment a week later? What was gonna happen to that student? She's not coming back. And it's because we were locating our work in what was easy and convenient for us, not what was truly foundational uh, that our students needed from us. Fortunately, um, not fortunately, I mean, she walked out of there in tears and she ran straight into me. And so I'm like, we're going to go see an advisor. And we turn around and saw an advisor. But the key is it shouldn't take the luck of running into the college president for our students to get the, the love and service they need from us. A lot of our students um, don't just bring the burden of family expectation with them. Um, their families have already fertilized ground of being afraid of going to college. Our families are afraid, especially if, they're, uh, if their student is first gen, that getting a degree means that they might lose the student, they're gonna get a degree, get a better job, we have families that are afraid that they're gonna lose their students because they come to us and are successful. Um, and so at Amarillo College, one of the things that our students immediately told us is that our orientations were completely set up wrong. What, the first thing that we were doing is when students would uh, come to the required orientation, and we highly suggested they bring their parents with them or their family members with them, and then what did we do? What do most colleges do? You check in and the students go over here and start engaging and we put families in a room and, and tell them don't helicopter, don't do, don't. We tell them all the things not to do. And what our students helped us understand is that our families have to be integrated into the process if we want our families to support students through the process. So we stopped worshiping at the altar of FERPA. We actually read what the law says, not what it had been interpreted by uh, schools and previous professionals. And FERPA allows you to share information with your families. But so often we have used our processes and our laws, which are designed to protect people, but we use them to protect ourselves from more work or more responsibility. And the last value that I think may be the most important and telling is the value of yes. Um, I was overwhelmed by how often my students said that their life had been defined by the word no. And how often they heard the word no from us when they came on our campus. 
when no might not have really been the answer, it might have been I don't know, <laughs> but no is easier, right? So what we do is we say yes at Amarillo College. It may be yes if or yes when or my favorite just yes, but we're saying yes. What I wasn't prepared for is that one value would have the biggest impact on our entire college. Um, not just serving our students, but when you come to meetings, when previously the meetings were about how we protected our territory and our budget and how we, we were writing policies because we didn't trust other people in the college to do their jobs, so we were writing policies to control how they did their job. We were coming together in meetings to talk about um, how we solve problems, but the problems that we solved were always about giving me more money and taking yours to do it. But now it's about how do we get to a yes? And it's not about protecting a territory or a division, because guess what? Your students don't give one iota what budget line your salary is paid out of. So why do you? When we're using our natural boundaries and harming students in the process, we're not walking in our best selves. And my challenge to you is to embrace how you can say yes to each other rather than finding ways uh, to get in the way. So we love our students, we're listening to them, we're empowering them, and then we had to understand them. Understand the student you have. Uh, and I know some of you have gone through this a couple of weeks ago. Donna Beagle came and uh, did training for your student affairs staff. Um, we closed the college, um, much like we have today, the entire campus spent a whole day being certified as poverty experts with Donna Beagle, and it was transformative. What happens when you don't teach about poverty is it ends up being uh, framed as the people's problem. So like we were talking about earlier, where we're the, we're the only country who tell people you are the cause of poverty if you would just work harder. And you know the numbers are clear, two thirds of the people are working, many people working two jobs, many people working three jobs, still getting evicted, still going hungry, making choices between utilities and their rent. So. Our, our realities about poverty, uh, they don't match our thinking about what's possible. So we learned a lot. Um, mostly what we learned is that we were being judgmental in ways that we didn't understand and that we had stereotypes of what poverty was without understanding what it actually is. Um, and a lot of our policies uh, that are dealing with students in financial stress are written from a situational poverty mindset of what I would do if I lost my job today. And before we started our training with Donna Beagle, we had um, noticed our success rates were terrible and our faculty and staff had decided it's because students aren't working hard enough. So we developed a whole campaign around hard work equals success. And then Donna Beagle came in two weeks later and it was like a slap upside the head. She's like, you can't do that, Russell. You cannot do that to your students. What we learned is that my situational poverty mindset is so different from the generational poverty mindset that the majority of our students have grown up, grown up in, that when I tell my students you need to work harder, what Donna helped us understand is that if you've grown up in the war zone of poverty, especially the war zone of generational poverty, you've never seen hard work pay off. You've seen a lot of hard work, but you've never seen it pay off. You've grown up where you had to take care of your siblings because both your parents were working two jobs and were not ever there. So this issue of poverty is not about hard work. It's not about work at all. The overwhelming majority of your students are already working. They're what we call the working poor. But we cannot assume that a job equates in this economy we can't assume that a job equates financial freedom. We can't assume that a job equates financial survival anymore. So we had to understand what it meant to grow up in generational poverty and the messages that it was teaching you about yourself if you grew up in that war zone and how we had completely mismanaged and mislanguaged the experience that our students were having when they came on our campus. So love, listen, understand, empower, 
And the last part of this is once you can love your students to success, listen to them, understand them and empower them, then you got to invest in them. And I think when you look at the list of resources that you have, you're doing that already. Here is what our no excuses poverty system looks like, uh, roughly. There are several elements to it. One is that we have a career and employment center, but instead of just focusing students on finding a job when they get a degree, we're trying to connect them with employers that give them flexibility uh, in their jobs to go to school while they're our student, not just trying to get them a job out after they graduate from us. We had to add uh, and extend our legal counseling center. Uh, I know some of you talked about with Sarah this morning, um, mental health. Uh, at Amarillo College, every employee has gone through mental health first aid because if you've grown up in generational poverty, then you've grown up in a, a situation that is challenging your mental health as much as it's challenging your physical health. We had to open up a legal aid clinic and connect our students to pro bono work um, because like I said earlier, we penalize poverty in this country. Um, we're, it's one of the things that Donna helped us understand, that we're so afraid that somebody in poverty might get something they don't deserve, that we build all of these rules and bureaucracies to, to basically protect us from two to 3% of the people that are gaming the system and punishing the 97% that aren't. And so we had to have a legal aid clinic because one of the things that we learned is our students, because they're working, can afford housing but they can't get into them, why? Any guesses? They can't afford the first and the last month's rent and criminal background checks. In a society that has put a lot of criminalization on marijuana, right? That we're now legalizing, <laughs> but we have all of these um, neighbors in our communities that are saddled with laws that no longer apply. So we had to have a legal aid clinic. Um, we have social services where we have four social workers. It's in the heart of our campus in an all glass enclosed uh, facility and the most prominent facility in our main campus. We have six campuses and we have an advocacy and resource center in every one of them. But even after all the work that we've done with Donna Beagle and mental health first aid and all of the, the attention we've gotten, we got a donor to help us put the Advocacy and Resource Center in this all a glass enclosed facility in the heart of the campus, the most visible place on the campus. And what was our faculty's initial reaction to that? They were really worried for our students. What were they worried about? They were worried that students might be exposed, that it would be so visible that everyone would know that the student had need. And you know what our students told us? I had one focus group that was the, the most uh, fun, but fundamentally this is what they told us. We know we're poor. We didn't know you knew we were poor. In Advocacy and Resource Center, when we took our social services off the periphery where our food pantry, when it started, was literally in a closet in the building on the outside of the, the campus and put it in the heart of the campus in an all glass enclosed, taking shame away from it. This isn't something to be ashamed of. This is the definition of living in our country now. Um, in the spring semester, we had 3,472 of our students, of our 10,000 students, go through our Advocacy and Resource Center. I don't think they were embarrassed. What it did is what they kept telling us over and over. We made it convenient, we had extended hours, and they had a social worker that would connect them to the resources in our community. You have a lot of resources in your community, great resources in your community, but the key is, do you have systems of connecting your students to them? Because it's not enough, and Sarah and I uh, argue about this all the time, it's not enough to put the thing on your syllabi. You've gotta be willing to be, make this personal and walk your students to the person that can connect them to those services in your community. Uh, we have food pantries and clothing closets. 
um, it's important. What I get really worried about is when people think that, oh, we have a food pantry, so we solve poverty. <laughs> it's not, it's, it may be the first step, but it's only a first step. It's great and you need them, but they, that's not where this work stops. Um, we are intentionally connecting our students to campus resources. So like tutoring is, a, is one of the things that we found out in our data analytics is the biggest predictor of success at Amarillo College is spending seven or more hours in one of our tutoring centers. That's amazing because for the first time in our history, the biggest predictor of success wasn't demographics, parent income, high school you graduated from, SAT, ACT scores. It was something that we actually had control over. So once we knew that, that our analytics showed us that tutoring was that important, we integrated it as a requirement in all of our classes. Um, and then we've got to connect our students to community resources. The one part that I want to spend a little bit more time on is emergency aid. Last year alone, we gave one $162,000 away in emergency aid. And it, was, it wasn't this when we started, but last year, every one of our emergency aid situations had money disseminated to the party that they were struggling with within 24 hours. And we do it because we actually believe our students when they tell us when they, tell us they have a need. Um, we were talking at dinner last night, so forgive me for the vernacular, my team hates it when I say this, and they implore me every time I travel not to. So I'm about to. <laughs> when we're dealing with people in crisis, and we're trying to help them, we so often engage in this, what I call poverty porn, where they come to our office and we demand that they perform their poverty for us and tell us how bad they have it and what they need. And then what do we do? We send them to the next office and they have to tell their story all over again. And then we send them to the next office and they have to tell their story again. And we send them to the fourth office and the fourth office, they're out of tears. And then that person's like, mm, I'm not sure you really need it. If your students tell you they need something, believe them. That was one of the biggest gifts that Donna Beagle helped us embrace is to trust our students. And you know what's happened when we walk and trust with our students, especially on emergency aid? Oftentimes, when they get over that emergency, they're bringing their food back, they're bringing what they didn't spend, they're bringing and contributing back to the emergency aid fund. But the key is when your students are in an emergency and you can't meet that need immediately, you're almost always going to lose them. So we have a retention calculator, and we've had a 12% increase in retention in the last two years, and we're investing $300,000 in um, the social services, emergency aid, the personnel associated with that. It's a hefty investment. It's not as much as people think, but it's a hefty investment. When we started this, it was all with grants, but now it's in institutionalized in our budgets. But with that investment of $300,000, because of the students that we were able to save, that brought a $4.6 million uh, revenue to the bottom line. So if you can't engage in saving students because you don't care what's happening with them, then care about your own job security. Every time you save a student, you're contributing to the health of your community and the financial health of your own institution. So when you can love, listen, empower, understand, and invest in the students you have, you'll actually graduate the students you have. When we started this reformation four years ago, our completion rates were 19%. Right now, they're 48%. I'm waiting on transfer data, and I think that if we were to have this conversation next month, I think that would be 55%. And we're not doing magic, folks. It's not magical what we're doing. We're simply, we simply decided to love our students, listen and empower them to tell us what they needed and then to rebuild ourselves around what they said. 
So our theory of change, removing a life barrier in an accelerated learning environment through a deep culture of caring, actually does equal completion, and it works. Once uh, I got interested in actually going to college, that took a lot out of me because I never thought that at my age that I would be able to graduate, go to school, much less graduate. I'm 33 years old. I just turned 33 December 31st, uh, 14, 15 days after my graduation. I relocated for one, relocating to Amarillo. You know, I'm from Wellington, Texas. That's an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes away. And uh, so this, the thought of moving to Amarillo was a big thing for me. I had to get out of myself, out of being, you know, my comfort zone because I don't know anybody in Amarillo. Um, the only thing that I got is myself, my wife and my kids. And, and you know, that was, uh, it was scary. Let's see, one, two, three, four classes a semester, four days a week, eight in the morning to 1.30 in the evening, you know, and uh, so for me, that was also a struggle, thinking to myself that, you know, uh, how am I going to be able to make car payments, you know, just the, the, the fight in me, the, the part of me that told me not to give up, you know, I went out and uh, I looked around for, for, for jobs that were, that had that evening schedule that I could take in order to work a full-time job. And uh, I did, uh, Derek Lyons is one of my teachers from, uh, from uh, the Advanced Diesel course, and he's an awesome teacher. And uh, he's really, he, he gets into the students, you know, he figures out w the things that you like, the things that you're good at, what you're learning, what's, you know, what he needs to improvise on. But, but he was, a, he found me a job, you know, he found me a full-time job that I could work eight hours a day and go to school five hours a day and make everything work. There were several times that, I, like I said, I just wanted to quit, you know, and life just threw curveballs at me left and right, you know. We were planning on bringing another, you know, another addition to the family. And, uh, well, my wife had some complications. We went to the hospital and uh, they did an emergency surgery on her right away and it took about two hours and, uh, we weren't able to have the baby, you know, but maybe it's, maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe it, you know, I don't know. Life just, life knows what it's doing. My mom gave me a pickup. This is an old pickup, you know. I, I'm not old school, but I'm old school, you know. And uh, this, this truck, it's a 92 Chevy Silverado. It's in standard. And uh, she gave it to me. She said, "Mijo, she said you're you're close enough to where you could, you're going to graduate. I can see it." She said, "I can see you graduating. We're not going to miss it for the world." She said, "You can have this truck." I said, "Mom, but that truck don't even run." He said, "Well, ain't that what you're going to school for?" <laughs> I said, "Well, yeah, uh, I did. I got under the hood. I put everything together. Took out what needed to come out and put in what needed to go in, and I got the truck running." Well the transmission went out. So um, I got uh, got a buddy of mine, he helped me tow it up here to Amarillo and uh, by that time I was broke. So uh, once I was having those problems, you know, I came, I came to, to Jordan, to Judith and Jordan, you know, and asked, what, you know, what kind, if, what are the possibilities that they would be able to help me cover some of these things? And uh, Jordan says, well, um, so we can look into it. So we do have some funding that's uh, for emergencies. So I brought her the receipts on some of the stuff that I spend. She said, okay, she said it amounts to this much and this much. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna turn these numbers in to the foundation and in a few days, they're gonna cut you a check. I said, what do you mean? Said, well, yeah, you were, you were approved and he said, um, in order for you to keep coming back to school, this is something that we need to help you with because we feel that if, if, you don't, if you're not making it to school, then we've done nothing. They've done so much for me, you know, even with the, you know, the, the transportation, um, they, they also helped me cover some of my tuition and even the food pantry, you know. We were able to, um, they, they helped us keep everything together. 
I said, well, you're gonna need a cap and a gown. I said, well, man, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of money, I'm out of time. Um, they said, well, Judas, uh, Jordan said, well, don't even worry about it. I think we've got one we can loan you. I said, well, I said, man. It, it, they just amaze me every time that they just keep giving, and, and I'm glad that they've been able to do that because that was something else that I didn't have to spend money on was my cap and gown. Well, I was talking to my advisor, um, Claudia, and she said, she said, uh, you, you, fi you find out what picture you want on your invitation, what you want your invitation to say, and I'm going to help you with it. I said, no way. I said, you don't have to do that. I said, I I'll find a way. I said, if my friends and family really want to see me, I said, I'll write them a post-it sticker and put it on their front door, and if they really want to come, then they'll be here. She said, oh, no. She said, you're, you're going to do it the right way. To be a part of something so big, to me, just blew my mind. The day that I showed up there to, to the Civic Center for, my, for the graduation, you know, I had my cap and my gown and I was walking in there and I kept seeing caps and gowns pass by and pass by and so many, so many of them. I said, man, is there really this many graduating? For me to be a, a part of something so big was freaking awesome. <laughs> um, and they're proud. They're proud of me. I think uh, I think they were they were the loudest fans. <laughs> I could hear I could hear them back there. Ooh, that's my dad. That's my dad. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter. She's uh she's 13 right now. And uh, she says, Dad, she said, what you did is amazing. You know, it's awesome. And uh, she said, I'm going to keep my grades up starting today. I'm going to keep my grades up. She said, I want to walk that same stage that you walked across. I said, baby, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. You know, I'm 32 years old. She's 13. She's got a long ways to go. But if I can do this and, you know, to to have to go through what I went through, I think anybody can do it. And you guys have the right help. You guys have the right attitude and the right people. I'm trying. We're privileged to work in this industry. You're privileged to work at Green River. Let's just make sure that the students that come in our paths are as privileged to be in our presence as we are privileged to be in theirs. So as you, um, as you go back to starting a new semester, a new quarter, you go back to um, what you've always done, the one thing that I challenge you to do is to make sure that you do it and don't forget to show love to whomever comes in your path. Thank you all so much. I was crying in the front. Um, I heard some sniffles in the area. Um, we're going to get our chairs set up here. We've got time for questions and answers, so those green index cards come in handy here. Thank you, my friend. So many things, so many things to talk about. Um, and of course, as always, for those braver souls, we have the microphones uh, standing, waiting. We're gonna get the chairs set up here. I didn't watch you do this with Sarah or I would have already moved it up here. <laughs> and I'm going to uh, buy some time for people to come to. I get so eager when, Jody, you broke my heart. You know, I get, I get so eager as I, as I see people approaching microphones like, no, no, I'm just taking that bio break. We're going to have a break uh, in about 15, 20 minutes if you can hang on, but I'm also hoping that some of you will come to the microphones. Um, and I know uh, if people have green index cards ready for questions, I'm sure we'll have a runner or two. Oh, Suzanne's collecting them. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to open this by sharing something uh, that I was experiencing during, during Russell's presentation. And I've, I've heard excerpts or elements of, of what he shared with us today. And I'm always moved in a dramatic way in hearing this Amarillo story. Um, and we were talking earlier uh, before uh, lunch was over, and he was commenting on how, how much he, he was loving and feeling the energy in this room and what great work we were doing. And I said, you know, I wasn't joking when I, when I had shared um, that the college has a compelling story to talk about from 2013 to uh, 2020 in terms of uh, the commission and our accreditation visit. I said, this college has been through a lot of challenges. And I was so grateful for the college to be willing, when I came, to try again, to get brave, to recommit to each other, to start taking those chances and trusting, uh, watching me to see if I was a trustworthy, um, consistent person, if I was going to do what I said, and so on. And I said, you know, we need trust because as we move forward in the work we're doing, it can be discomforting. And we have to be able to be comfortable in our discomfort. And if we're comfortable in our discomfort and we trust each other, we know that however we move forward and however we determine we need to make modifications or evolve our college into the future, we know that we'll have each other's backs and we care about each other. And we can trust each other in this work. Because we trust and respect and value what we each bring to the solution. Our students need all of us. So as I was listening to Russell share with us the whole Amarillo story, which I've heard for the first time now with all of you, the whole story of what work has been underway there at the college. And I thought about the faculty at Amarillo, the student affairs staff at Amarillo, um, the IT people, all the different areas. How these changes may have resonated with them and I have to tell you that as I sat and contemplated, what would this look like at Green River? Can we do this kind of thing at Green River in terms of moving our needle, right? The doubling our completion. I have to tell you that I felt in my stomach discomfort. <laughs> I felt discomfort because I think we all know the kinds of things that we would like to do and that we know we need to do. But even more so, we have a lot more listening to do. And then what will that mean for us in terms of response? And I was discomforted. Not in a bad way, but I was discomforted. So I, I thought to myself, how's everyone else feeling in the audience? How are the staff and faculty feeling listening to this story? So my first question I would like to ask Russell is can you relate to anything that I shared with you in our roles? And what were your experiences at the campus in terms of getting to where you are now? How did the voices get heard in terms of staff and faculty? How did, how did everyone's commitment and clarity in, in believing in students and loving students, how did that express itself in terms of working through being a different college than what we probably experienced as students, if we were, if we're academics, um, or that we've come to know a college to be? I think that's the, the heart of the struggle in higher education right now, is there, there are some of us that are just waiting for all this to blow over so we can go back to being comfortable again. And and then there are those of us that understand there ain't no going back. Because if we try to go back to where we were, um, we won't survive. All of the resources will be directed to those that are, 
being transformative or there'll be pop-up reinvestments in for-profits that will um, that will take our place in society away from us. Um, I started the Reformation really with for-profits, uh, with secret shoppers, because the for-profits were eating our lunch in our community. So I sent four students, I paid them a scholarship to go into the for-profit. Um, only three of them came back. And you know what they said when they went there? They, they all said they walked into this place and someone gave them a hug and said, we're so proud of you for changing your life today. And then in an hour and a half, getting to know them in a we just want to get to know you interview had completed the application in FAFSA just by giving answers to the person they were, that was getting to know them. They just made the process simple and easy and honoring. And wrapped in love and pride. Now, a lot of them do it uh, for an ulterior motive that's um, fundamentally stealing students' futures from them. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from them, that our processes can, can be more effective and more efficient. Um, so if we're waiting for things to, to, if we're waiting for things to calm down so we can just go back to the way our jobs used to be, that ain't happening, folks. The, the new norm is um, constant change. And often that change is gonna be inflicted on us from outside our industries and we're gonna have to be responsive to it or we're gonna be left behind. When we started this reformation, 2014, I was president for all of four months when the state cut us $4 million and I had a newly elected board that said, we're not gonna solve a shortfall by raising taxes and tuition anymore. Kill the bureaucracy and we'll consider investing more money in you. So if you would have told me that that president that was sitting there going, how am I going to tell my colleagues <laughs> that not only are we not hiring positions, but we're fundamentally going to have to eliminate 12% of our entire employee base? That we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We don't good. have to do we it. We're solid. Just saying. You, you don't have to do it. You've already made tough choices. You already have, have gone beyond your crisis. But we had been avoiding crises for three decades. Yes. We couldn't kick the tan, can down the road anymore. But I think we showed our heart and our character by understanding the crisis, facing it, and deciding we were going to honor it by getting better. And the way we honored it was instead of listening to ourselves, because we were the ones that kind of screwed it up, we listened to our students and redesigned uh, ourselves to be the college they needed. Wow. So I, I don't know where to begin here. I'm, I'm trying to scan and be so strategic with these cards. I'm already coming across a couple of questions related to the same um, item. There is a lot of interest in the tutoring requirement. Yes. So you mentioned the seven hour tutor requirement. Well, it's not a requirement, but, requ but tutoring is required in our classes with triggers. All of so our genetic classes. can talk a little bit more about that? So let's say you're in a math class and your homework, you have a 75 or below on the homework. You are required to, to, to go to 30 minutes of tutoring, which is also available online or through Blackboard Connect. And we have a, a, a tutoring center that's open from 6 in the morning till midnight. Wow. Um, it didn't start out that way. Did you uh, and then on a test, if you, if you get 75 <laughs> or below on a test, you're required to, take one, to go to one hour tutoring. And so our faculty are communicating with tutors. Our tutors have access to the Blackboard. They can look at grades. They can look at tests. And so when, this tutor, when they're coming in, the tutors are tutoring them specifically to what they're struggling with, not doing the generalized tutoring that we tend to do. And, and so we've done, academically, we've done a lot of course redesign and central to our course redesign was uh, flipping the classroom and integrating tutoring as a requirement. And so all of our gen ed classes have required, required tutoring now. Wow, um, I suspect, and, and I'm sure I haven't gone through the whole pile yet, um, it, just as a FYI too, I mean, Russell's gonna be with us all afternoon and we have a reception if you're interested and able to stay at four o'clock. So if there are more 
follow-up questions related to the tutoring. I think that's probably something that's... Listen, I got more fun. sermons for you. <laughs> so, so he'll be available, too, after, after our session um, today. Um, here's a question. For your focus groups, and I think we're talking about student focus groups, did you need to incentivize student participation, and if yes, how? Um, and how long and how did you respond to the issues that arose? It's a great question. So um, I don't know that we needed to incentivize, but I think it's really important that if we're going to ask our students to give us their time that we need to compensate them for it. So I went to our foundation. George? <laughs> and, and I asked for them to fund um, paying students $100 to be, folk, for, to be secret shoppers. And I'm, I'm four years into that process and I have between 10 and 30 secret shoppers every year. And then when we initially did this work, paying uh, students $50 to come to an hour and a half focus group. Oh, we have, okay, let's shift to mics. Go. Hi. I have a question that started percolating for me this morning, but um, has come to greater clarity. I have been teaching a lot of online classes, and I find that I have students who are solely online asynchronous students. Yeah. But they are in no less or different need in terms of support and sort of wraparound service and that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of times I'm the only contact they have at the college yeah. that's in any way dynamic. And like I said, they are truly asynchronous, right? Where yeah. we spend very little, if any, synchronous time together. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that student. And I have if, a lot of thoughts about yeah, that student. And what you all have done <laughs> to support to address that particular. So it's a really great question and I don't think that we have a great answer yet. But um, what our data analytics showed is that our most at risk students were the ones that were trying to take all online classes, why? Work, family. Because that was, allowed them to live their lives and work their two jobs and raise their family and then they go to school and we were doing data analytics and our, um, we had uh, our anatomy and physiology, a and um, We had an online section of that class and it had an 18% pass rate. We were stealing money from students. And yet we had a wait list a mile long. They knew, we were advising them that this wasn't a good medium for them to take that particular class. But it was, they were willing to sacrifice their future and A&P being successful in that class determine whether you got into the health science fields that they were wanting to get into because they needed that flexibility. So we immediately took it offline and, and put it in course redesign. Um, but, so what we learned from those students in that process is they need community as much, if not more than anyone else. And if we offer it to our face-to-face -face students, we have to offer it in, in some form or fashion mm -hmm. Uh, to our online students. So in our, in our, like in our early alert system, any faculty or advisor or employee can go in and log in to our system and do an early alert that social services related. We added social services to our early alert system. So, but what we were doing is we were offering face-to-face -face counseling, we were offering tutoring, we were offering relationship coaching to our face-to-face -face students, and we can't, if we're doing it to face-to-face, -face, we had to do it for online. So now we're using Blackboard Connect where they're getting uh, counseling services online. They can connect with social, social services online through Blackboard Connect, um, and the faculty uh, can early alert them and connect them to the social services just like they can any. Tutoring is now available through Blackboard Connect where they can do it from their house, but they can log in to connect and see a tutor face to face, but just through the technological medium. It's hard and we haven't figured it out, but we know we have to. Thanks, Kelsey. Vic, you're up. Yeah. Uh, I'm Vic Bahal, I'm English faculty and also co-chair of the Green River Diversity and Equity Council. Awesome. Want to thank you uh, for the focus today on, on poverty. I think that's a very crucial reminder 
of uh, what our students are facing. Uh, and you also invoked uh, uh, Donna Beagle, who will be coming here November 13th uh, again as part of the uh, GDEC and ODEI uh, diversity educational series. Uh, the question that I had for you, I want to also acknowledge uh, Liz Rangel of ODEI for uh, pushing for us to bring Donna Beagle. Um, the question I have for you is, as your college has undertaken this very intentional work of identifying uh, what the students need and, and how we uh, as college uh, staff, faculty administrators, how we have to take responsibility for, for meeting those needs, I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about racial equity mm -hmm. as part of the equation. Certainly, uh, class and race intersect in very intricate ways. Uh, I recently was, was very uh, taken by the category of intersectional racial equity. I've been yeah. very familiar with intersectional feminism as an important intervention, uh, but intersectional racial equity. Mm -hmm. So I, I was hoping you could share with us on campus how that's been part of the steps that you've taken. Um, I appreciate the question, Vic. I think it's an important one. Uh, and my answer um, is going to be put in context to where I live, okay? So um, we're a, an MSI. We're a minority-serving institution. Uh, and we have a lot of support for our students. I also live in the, the most conservative congressional district in the entire country and 82% of my neighbors voted for Trump in the last election. So, yet the majority of my students come from underrepresented backgrounds. The majority of my community does. Um, and we, really, we were really intentional about engaging in this equity work, and we have closed our equity gaps in every category but African American men. Um, so we closed our equity gaps through a culture of caring and with, without drawing political attention to the students that we were caring about. And so my answer is different than what I hope your answer would be because my political context is different. And so if I talk about the number of dreamers that we have, every time I talk about that publicly in my community, I feel like I put those very students at risk by bringing attention to them in ways that aren't helpful to them. You don't have those same barriers in this community. You, ha you might have some. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't think that we are um, a good shining example of how you have those conversations. Uh, because I think, honestly, trying to do this work, um, it's, it's been politically difficult enough to make our entire identity around poverty in a community that wanted to pretend like it didn't exist politically, if that makes any sense. And incidentally, um, I can share with you, it, the majority of students that are currently enrolled in our Auburn school system, now we serve Auburn, Kent, Enumclaw, Tahoma, and so on, but over 50% of the students in our K-12 Auburn school district live in poverty. Now, that doesn't say that 50, over 50% 50 of our families live in poverty in Auburn, because families can have multiple children. But over half of all the children enrolled in our main city that provides us students live in poverty. Well, and here's what's so powerful about that that most people don't understand. Do you know when the federal definition of poverty was established? 1967. Do you know when that federal definition of policy changed? It hasn't. Poverty in 1967, the federal government is evaluating it at the exact same rate in 2019. Um, so when you have families living in poverty, the, the, the best moniker is free and reduced lunch, and 78% of my students in Amarillo qualify for free and reduced lunch, um, which isn't out of the norm for your community or anyone else. This is not an issue we can ignore anymore. But we are the best solution to solve it. Getting a credential or a degree that leads to a living wage 
is the best way out of generational poverty. And so it's why completion is so powerfully important. Um, it's not just making a new life possible for the student that comes through you and graduates, but it's making your, your economic future as a community salvageable. So just another little statistic for you. Um, 96% of students that are in our service area, which of course that means many high schools, I think we, we serve 12 high schools um, in our service area, 96% <clears throat> of high school students say they want and, and plan to go on to college. We know in our service area only about 60% actually end up doing that. And six years later, only about half of them have achieved any completion of a two or four year degree or credential. So we have a lot of hope and dream in our K-12 system. But in our service area and as a state of Washington, we have a 60% going to college behavior or you know, returning to college as it might be. So it's a compelling, compelling landscape that we're in. So here are a couple of, oh. Our friend has been standing there oh, for a long okay. time. I can't see Thank with you. the sun, sorry. <laughs> It's okay. We can't Hi. ignore you any longer. My name's Andrew. Um, I am the Associate Director of International Student Advising here at Green River. Um, I was just recently promoted to this position, and for the first time in my life, I now supervise staff. <laughs> so my question for you is, you talk a lot about a culture of caring amongst students. I'm really curious to hear about how you create a culture of caring amongst your staff so that they can in turn care for students. As someone who's now going to be supporting staff, I'd love to hear your insights about how do you create a culture of caring amongst your faculty and staff? I, Thank you. I, I, think, I think the same principles apply. Um, listening, uh, understanding what uh, our, our colleagues need, but, but I wanna be really clear with this. I am always open and I, I have uh, tons of forums and meetings and coffees and pizzas. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm always in communication with, with my colleagues and I think what they have to say is critically important. But what I can't, what I will always fight against is any conversation we, we're, we are trying to place our needs as more important than our students. So you want, um, at Amarillo College, the power of our story is that we have unified and taken care of ourselves by understanding and unifying around loving our students. When you are love, I think you, love is not something that you can turn off and on. I think it becomes an imminent in who you are. And if you look at our culture survey data, um, the love that we are intentionally showing our students and intentionally showing each other um, has coincided. Um, you can't have one without the other, but so often I feel like, and, and the culture that we had at Amarillo College is we loved each other and we thought we were amazing. And that's where it stopped, like, oh, we're amazing. Oh my God, I love working with me. Um, <laughs> but, but our data showed us that we weren't amazing uh, and that maybe this culture that we had built that we were so proud of was misplaced and our priority was ourselves and not our students. So it's important, but the way, we, um, the way we show that culture of caring for our employees is a lot of professional development. We've invested a lot in professional development, a lot in travel, um, uh, a, a, a lot in um, outside the office support. Um, we're doing things we've never done before. We have a, a cook team and once a month we're making burgers for each other and if Suzanne was there a gluten-free salad <laughs> um, I'm known it, it the, what you're doing for your students you can do for yourself but my concern and I might be overly concerned about it is that when we get so when we get too focused on ourselves we forget who we're really focused on so I'm going to um, add a piece to this because this question asks, as a faculty member preparing for fall, what can I do right now, underlined, 
to help my students achieve success this quarter. So I want to add to, as a faculty member or a staff person, preparing for fall. So love this question. I would say two things. One of the things that we've empowered all of our uh, faculty and staff to do is the week before class and the week of class, we have what we call AC greeters. And we're just voluntarily stationed at different parts of the college and looking for students that seem like they need help and then helping them. And usually that help means walking them to an office. And oftentimes people think when we're we, like, I need to go to the financial aid office and I don't know where it is. So we were walking to the financial aid office, getting them there and then realizing that's not where they needed to be. Or all they needed to do was to accept their financial aid. And so we've done a lot of cross training um, where faculty and staff have become financial aid experts and advise, you know, helping while we're walking students places, logging on and helping them solve some of the problems they have so they don't have to stand in a line to do it. The second thing, um, and, and, and it's labor intensive, but text or email every student before they come to your class and tell them how excited you are to have them, that tell them your personal story and that you're willing to do whatever it takes to help them if they're willing to do whatever it takes to learn. And you'll be shocked at how many people respond to you before the first day of class, and you'll be shocked at how many people actually show up the first day of class after they've gotten that email from you. You know, that reminds me, um, during our break, a uh, number of people were commenting on the letters of hope that you were all drafting. And uh, there was a suggestion, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if we could get those out into email or to, through text or some other venue to students? I, I think that that's something very profound as a potential. And so we're, we're putting data behind that now. So through our data analytics, we've identified uh, 617 students that have an intersexuality of risks that make them the most at risk. And every one of those students has gotten a phone call, a text, and a letter, not just to them, but to their families. Uh, introducing to them to their advocate, their coach, they get a coach. Um, that coach will go with them to, and it's all voluntary, that coach will go to their advising session, that coach will go with them to the first time they go to a faculty office hour, but we're communicating with students that are the most at risk before um, the class ever starts. Um, and that's been really, really transformative. Wow, okay, last question before our break and coffee, tea, brownies, and cookies. Um, I think about half of the cards that remain in my hand, which are pretty hefty, are all asking uh, basically the same question. I'm going to choose this one to sort of articulate it. With that much transformation, did you have much pushback from, None. and here's this, have, uh, did you have much pushback from governance? Um, how did you give faculty staff buy-in? What was the pushback? And how long did it take to stop having pushback? And when did you get by well, it? So I, variations I would, on this. It's a, it's a really great question, fair question. We're an academic institution. Pushback never stops, right? Um, by, by our nature, we question and we challenge and we debate. That's, that's foundational to the culture of higher education. We don't want to lose that. What we do want to lose is the, the personal rancor um, and, and distrust that often comes with it. And so um, we really struggle initially. I mean, what we've done is, is transformational and it's scary. It's scary to tell faculty, listen, we're going to have to do things differently and you're going to have to go through course redesign systemically and we're going to have to integrate tutoring and we're going to go to OER, and by the way, we've got these um, social workers, and can they come to your class, can they talk? I mean, it, it's, been, um, it's been successful because we never stopped talking to each other. Data and students were at the center of it. So we had a data summit, much like we did today. We spent five hours talking about our data and getting really clear on who we were. And once you have clarity on where you are 
it's hard to defend something that is clearly not working. So then it becomes how do we join and lock arms in each other to rebuild it? And, and rebuild it as a family, not as se sections of the family. So it's not about faculty and then about classified and about administrative. It's about, it's about the Amarillo College family and what we're all doing to help and learn from each other. And there's lots of things that we do to build that kind of communication and culture. Um, but there was a lot of pushback. And I will say the first year that we did it, um, I was really scared that I might get a vote of no confidence. I was really worried about it. Yeah. Uh, instead, I got a vote of confidence. Like, the, there were some really loud naysayers, and, and the naysaying was really more about fear than it was about me. It was fear that what I'd been doing might not have been working. It was fear that, um, that I might have to do something I'm not equipped to do. Um, or that I might lose control of something that I've always had control of. Mm. And so data drove the conversations and then we always listen to students. It's hard to look students in the face and say you're wrong when they tell us what they need. Um, and a credit to our faculty and staff um, to look at the data and to listen to students and to listen to each other and then craft this um, reformation together. This wasn't Russell's vision that I inflicted on my colleague. Once we knew we were in crisis, um, we spent a whole year um, trying to figure out how to save ourselves from, from the financial crisis we were in. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things I'd like us to, to think about, and I've always, I've said this in meetings, and some of you are in meetings with me more often than others, um, that phrase buy-in has always turned my stomach um, because no matter what, it sort of indicates a power dynamic. It indicates manipulation. So I'd like us to leave those words behind. And let's think about shared ownership. Because that's what really moves us forward in whatever we know and we choose to do, which is best for our service area and the college. So let's build from here in terms of shared ownership. No more buy-in talk about. No more buy-in. Shared ownership and responsibility. So we're going to take a 15-minute break, and we're going to be talking about Green River College students. When you get back, Russell's had us create composites of students from different populations that we serve currently. And he's going to be walking us through pretty much an Amarillo process to get us thinking about our next steps moving forward. So one of the other green cards and by the way, it would be good to dance. Happy. Um, so this is a card that was brought up with the questions. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, I'm a 2018 graduate of Green River College. And I'm a new employee. I wanted to walk away several times from Green River but it showed me love. Thank you, Leanne, Shannon, Deb Casey, and Dan. And we were just talking, and I had asked if, if she would come up and share a moment or two. One of our newest Green River employees yes. about don't forget to show love. I, um, a long t I raised a large family. I have nine kids. I have 32 grandchildren. I am not worried. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I don't think I did it for bowels. Um, I decided to go back to school, and I showed up on Green River's campus. I walked away. I decided to go somewhere else. I ended up at Highline. I got to my last quarter in Highline. I had an issue. There was no one there. I couldn't turn left. I couldn't turn right. I couldn't turn behind me. I couldn't look in front of me. No one was there. So I waited and I waited and I waited. I didn't go back to Highline. I gathered up my courage and I came back here. 
it was hard. My sister went here, she didn't have a good experience. I, had, I know a lot of people that came here that walked away. I was gonna do the same. I was on my way out the back door of Salish Hall and Leanne was on her way in to her class at 7 a.m. She stopped. She said, what's going on? Why are you going out that door? I just seen you come in that door. And I was like, I'm leaving. I'm done. She said, no. No, you're not done. You just started. And I was in tears. I'm a crier, if you can't tell. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. I know. Thanks to, uh, yeah, yeah, right there. <laughs> um, she took me in her office. She sat me down. She talked with me. She took me where I needed to go around this campus. You're talking about showing love? This lady did not even know my name. Shannon, I want to say thank you to Shannon as well. There were times that I wanted to walk out that classroom because I was the oldest person there. She told me, no, you got this. Because you're not moving as fast as everybody else doesn't mean you don't have it. You got this. She kept pushing, she kept pushing. She was like, anything you need, I got you. I also had an issue in a class. Deb Casey brought me into her office, sat me down and said, do not walk away. You're going to graduate. And I was like, yeah, okay, lady. I'm really pissed off at that moment. <laughs> I'm like, Sh you shut up. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. I'm leaving. And she was like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> she said, no, you're not. She said, we're going to talk this through. <laughs> We're gonna talk this through and we talked it through. I graduated in 2018 my father all of my grandkids My sisters my brothers and some friends uncles aunts were there to watch me walk across that stage It was the proudest moment in my life Pretty sure there's more to come, but I just want to say thank you to Green River Deb, you know, I love you, you know <laughs> Dan Hodges is why I'm an employee today. Thanks, Dan. I know you're not here, but thank you. Someone please tell him I said thank you. Um, showing love means stepping outside of yourself. If you have any questions, please refer to Ms. Deb Casey, Leanne Simpson, and Shannon Sharp, and Dan Hodges, and our Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Don't, don't go anywhere. Can, can you do me a favor? Hold this, because I've completely dis disassembled myself. But um, I can't think of a better Gator moment than what just happened. So if you would allow me the privilege to Gator pin you, I would really enjoy that. Sure. I'm so happy you chose us, and I'm so happy that you are here at Green River College with us. Well, I'm happy you guys chose me. Because <laughs> you did. You chose me. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. okay. Russell, it's all yours. How can I, I mean, you have Sarah and now that. How can I drop that? Obviously, you have employees that are loving people to success every day. I, I think the, the key is to privilege those stories, to understand them, and understand that those can't just happen by sheer luck, that it has to be intentional and thoughtful and systemic. Um, it's not enough to have the supports that you have and to have the amazing people you have, but you've got to, to free uh, yourselves up to to make this work personal. So thank you for the courage to share how personal it's been for you. Thank you. Um, so you have uh, composites in front of you and we're gonna talk through them really quickly. These are your uh, Maria's. So you have Matthew that's a state supported student. This is the profile of your state supported students. Um, identifies a student of color, 22 years old, uh, first gen, low income, uh, graduated high school, wants a degree, and wants to transfer. Your transfer student profile is a 23-year-old Hispanic uh, student who's first-gen, um, single, 
intends to get a degree and wants to transfer, but needs developmental math in order to do that. Then you have Andrew, who is your technical student, who's 28, um, who's also first gen, uh, single, uh, intends to get a degree, needs developmental ed and math, um, and works part time while he's going to school. Then you have your transitional student, uh, who's Asian, 34. Uh, she's married with children. Um, she has a GED or a diploma, um, but has no degree plans at Green River. Then you have your Running Start student, which is your, de your um, dual enrollment students, right? Um, so she's 17, Asian, parents who are college educated, uh, has uh, means, um, wants to transfer, is college ready, enrolled full time, and likes your online course offerings. Then you have Huey, who's an international student, 20 years old, Asian, from college educated parents. Um, he has no degree plans here. You're a pass through for him. Um, but he's college ready in math, but needs developmental English. So what does it mean for you to love the students that you have? And that's the question that I want you to talk about. You have these composites in front of you, so you can talk about who your students are, like we talk about Maria, talk about who your students are, and what does it mean to love each one of these students to success at Green River? Go. <laughs> I've heard really uh, rich discussions at your tables, and I don't want to squelch them, uh, but I'm going to anyway. Um, I'm not going to necessarily have report outs for this particular uh, conversation, except we have a table back here that felt like that their program wasn't represented. So I want you to tell, introduce us to your student uh, and what that composite is. Hello, my name's Kerry O'Brien. That's since that's what we're doing today. Um, so I work for the Open Doors um, program. So we're going through the characteristics and- Well, tell, tell people, I, they may know what Open Doors is, but mm -hmm. I don't, so tell me yeah, what that so means. Yeah, so we are a youth re-engagement program here on campus. We help students um, try to earn some type of um, high school credential while also pursuing some type of um, certification or associate's degree. So our dual enrollment, but not essentially a running start students, just a different population. And we also um, help students through our transitional studies program to pursue a GD or some their high school credential. So we had a little, we had to create our own Carlos, um, the kind of uh, Charlie, uh, 19 year old student, identifies as a student of color, first gen, low income full-time student, um, has not graduated from high school or has a high, um, high school credential, not uh, most likely ready in, um, in English um, for college, um, not ready in math. Uh, his high school grades are most likely below a 2.0. Um, it's going to be a part-time student working towards an associate's degree. And yeah, so I think, I think most of our faculty know that these students are in your classes, so I just want to make sure that um, you keep these students in mind. They might come in with um, a little bit more barriers, so keep that in mind. They might be a little bit more fragile when it comes to when they're walking into your classes, so I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of this new uh, population, if you're a new faculty member, that we do have um, this, um, yeah, this demographic. Awesome, thank you for sharing. So I, I, I heard some really good discussions that I want us to be able to circle back to and maybe even 
uh, go back to your tables to talk about. So one of the things that I heard when I was walking around listening um, is can you love students and be rigorous at the same time? So here is my question to you that I want you to talk about at your tables. Why would we equate love with reduced rigor? Go. So I appreciated the dialogue around this. Does, does anyone want to come to a microphone and talk to us about love versus rigor? Otherwise, you're just going to get another sermon from me, so somebody better go to the microphone. Anybody want to address love versus rigor? Anybody want to come to a mic and address love versus rigor? All right, thank you. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but... We kind of looked at each other and said, rigor is love, mm. right? As long as, it's, as long as it comes with support, right? right? And, and the, a culture that supports it. If it's rigor for rigor's sake, that's just about power, right? But if you have rigor because you care and because you desire a positive outcome in terms of someone's growth and you support that, then the two are the same. Right, they, they are equivalent to one another. Brilliant, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Making it easier for someone to get to class and supporting their learning in class does not mean you're reducing rigor. Um, the most unloving thing you can do is to give a degree away without requiring learning to be associated with it. Um, that's a terrible thing to do and it's not helping your community or your students. So thank you for that. Um, that was brilliant, and I need it on video so I can take you with me to every other school that I talk to. Got it. Awesome. Uh, OK, so we had another conversation about what does it mean to love your students' success, a great idea, and I want you to hear it. Not even an idea that's going to cost you anything to do. Thank you. I don't interface with students, but I have two daughters who are students. And I thought, uh, based on what our table was saying, these students coming in don't even know what they don't know. So, and some of them are very pressed for time. And I thought, what if we did an online video of older students answering the question, what do you wish you knew when you started at Green River? So you're getting students to help who've gone through your processes to help those that are getting ready to go through it. It's great. It's awesome. If, if, students were, if, if students were to ask you questions like, what do I need to do to be successful here? How would you answer that with each other? One of the more difficult conversations that we had at Amarillo College is that in our advising uh, department, there was a list of faculty classes that they would advise their students not to take. Why? It was too hard. It was about power, not rigor. Um, but if we have knowledge in one part of the college that there are certain sects that we would advise our students away from in other parts of the college, then we have already created a hostile environment that we put our students in because we don't trust each other enough to have that conversation. So I went and got the list from advising, and then I went and sat down with the Vice President of Academic Affairs, and we talked to every faculty member that was on that list. And I still have a job. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know what was so shocking? Yes. Is how shocked those faculty members were to learn. No one had ever had the courage to talk to them about the struggle students were having in their class. Um, some of it was a language barrier, some of it was a technological barrier, some of it was just a, a lack of understanding of each other barrier. But part of a culture of caring is caring enough about each other to have the courage to talk to each other about what your struggles are, rather than talking about each other about the struggles that exist. Does that make sense? 
We're really good at talking about the things that don't work. We talk about them all the time. We're not as good in a culture of caring as going and talking to the people that, or the processes or the office that are struggling the most. So ha I think part of loving the student you have is having the courage to talk to each other about the struggles that they're having and, and not, um, not making it personal when it might not be. Um, that's Russell Sermon number 42 for the day. <laughs> um, any other conversations that you had at your tables about who your typical student is or what it means to love them to success or uh, any other ideas that you want to share with the rest of the college before we go to the next topic? Silence doesn't scare me, so. <laughs> All right, then let's talk about what's next. You have values that are, I think, at your table. High quality, student success, access, equity, engagement, global awareness, stewardship, innovation, campus environment. Um, here is my challenge to you. How do those values that are sitting at your table directly affect how you do your work? Go. So let's come back together and, and talk about some key elements that came out of your conversations about um, your values in general. So, I, I think a lot of times, and I'm, I'm not suggesting this has happened or is happening at Green River, but a lot of times these values are written by a committee and they go into an accreditation report and a catalog and they don't mean anything. Um, but fundamentally, from my perspective, your values drive how you do your work. It's your identity. Uh, as an institution and should be driving your identity as an employee. So I think the exercise that you just engaged in can be really helpful. You're getting ready to start a new strategic plan and I think you have an opportunity to think about what your values are and how you hold yourselves accountable to them. So at Amarillo College, and again, I'm not suggesting that you follow this model, um, our values are so important that they are written into every job description and they are foundational to our hiring process. So it used to be when we were hiring uh, personnel, faculty and staff, is that you would meet the requirements and we would interview you and then we would pick the person that most met the requirements. So if you had a PhD from Harvard, that might be more important than if you had a PhD from West Texas A&M. Um, what we're doing now with HR is every department identifies the basic minimum requirements that you have to have to do the job. And then when we interview you, we're not looking at your credentials at all. HR said you passed the credentials, now we're making sure that you can live these values and understand them and, and challenge us to be better uh, in representing them. Um, I, I think that as you go through the next year to year and a half in your strategic planning process, you're gonna spend a lot of time talking about your values and what they represent and how you interact with each other and how you interact with your students. So when you look at your values, these are, these are great values. Um, I don't know that there's anything wrong. I don't know that I would change your values. You'll have to determine that. But the key is, you can't just have this be the one time in a year that you are thinking about what your institutional values are. These should be things that drive how you think about your work on a daily, weekly basis. Does that make sense? Um, so as you go through your strategic planning process, evaluate the values that you want to define how you engage with each other and how you engage with your students. Were there any conversations that you had about um, how these values represent your work at your tables that you want to share with the rest of us. 
last time I sat up here in silence and then I moved on right as two people stood up at the mic, wanted to stand up at the microphones and I ignored them. I'm not going to ignore you this time. <laughs> Someone tell us about the conversations at your table uh, related to this question. I knew one person couldn't take the silence. I tried to recruit other people. I didn't want to dominate the microphone for my table, but, but it, I laid this out and got it printed up, and uh, so I'm, I'm kind of familiar with it. Uh, and I was noticing as, as I was laying it out earlier, these, these core values here, this, this is almost like a checklist for every single thing we do from laying out flyers to designing websites, to writing copy, to looking at our, our target audiences, which is primarily students or, or potential students. I mean, everything from, we, we always start with student success, everything's gotta be high quality, you know, student access, that's a big one for us. Every single document we remediate, we remediate with love because somebody else is gonna get to see it that would not normally be able to see it in kind of like the old way of thinking. Uh, I mean, community engagement, equity is a big thing. Uh, global awareness, we have a, a, a wonderful international population here. Uh, stewardship, I mean, look around at all the trees and all the air stuff, is, that's, and that goes with campus environment. And innovation, that's a big one. I mean, we always try and connect, you know, students Innovation with student opportunity, you know, it, it's, it goes into the design and the, that what Michelle was saying earlier that we start with words and ideas, you know, and then put that into what we communicate to the students for the students. So, I mean, the values that are very important to college relations. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. When we have our general assembly like you're having today, um, we started four years ago, once we identified these values, the end of every General Assembly became an AC team challenge. And so everyone that worked in the college would be on a team of people eight to 10. Again, don't do this. It was crazy <laughs> and hard to manage. And we, and we made it more laborious than it needed to be. But each General Assembly has a team challenge focused on one of our five values. And the first team challenge was focused on wow. How could we wow our students? And what came out of that conversation and what came out of those, um, those team ideas, which is completely riffed off of what Zappos does. If you go to Zappos, which is really known for great relationships with the people they serve. Uh, so I sent a team to Zappos and someone will ring a bell and everyone's like, oh, it's the bell. And then they all coordinate, they make signs, we need two people from IT, we need someone from sales. They create their teams, they pitch an idea, and three years ago, the winning idea became the commercial for their Super Bowl ad, Zappos Super Bowl ad. But the winning team got $100,000 that they uh, got to pocket. Uh, that $100,000. At Amarillo College, the winning team got $10. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ooh, okay, somewhere between ten and 100000 we can probably do. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we gave each team, the winning team got uh, $10,000, and they donated it back to the foundation. And then the next year, we are like, you have to take the money. It's about rewarding great ideas. And then last year, we finally just said, why are we paying each other for our ideas, and we stopped making it a reward and just made it a part of our process. But the first year, our wow team challenge ideas related to our values, where I thought we were gonna get ideas about, we need these new events and we need, you know what they were almost all focused on? Is how terrible our processes were and our rewriting our policies and how we could integrate things across the college. This doesn't have to be big sexy work, right? Sometimes it's just, living your values by being, taking what you do every day and just making it a little bit better. Um, so whether that is making access better or innovation, um, your values don't have to call you to, um, you know, a 60 minutes uh, worthy idea. It can just call you to 
um, and prove something that's a barrier for your students. So as you go through your strategic planning process, I really am going to challenge you and Suzanne to think about the place that your values have, what they mean to you and represent to you, and how you live them uh, every day. Any other comments or questions about values? Then let's go to the, the last uh, question. So um, you have, I think you have just a list of things already that your college support systems that your college has for your students. You should be incredibly proud of the massive amounts of supports that your college has and that your county and your region have for your students. I just identified three of them that I thought were really great, your benefit hub, uh, the emergency funds that you have, and then the King County Promise. These are big things in and of themselves that you can build around. They're incredible and you should be really proud of them. Any barrier that your student has, you probably have already identified a solution for. So what question am I gonna ask you about what you're already doing, right? Well, let me tell you. It's not enough to have a list of things that your students could use if they're not using them. And the danger that I think we fall into in higher education is it's what I call the checkbox leadership. Um, they'll hear something, oh yeah, we do that. Oh yeah, we do that, yeah, we do that. The question isn't what you're doing, it's how effective is what you're doing. And so one of the reasons that we've been able to make the big shifts in student success at Amarillo College is that we become very intentional about how we connect our students to these resources. So we built a network of resources in the community and in the college, and we're very intentional about how we make sure students know about them, get access to them, and have someone advocate for them through the process. So the question that I want you to have at your table is given all of the support systems that you have in place, how can you intentionally connect your students to these supports? Go. Who wants to share some ideas that you have? They've got a lot of ideas, clearly. How do we intentionally connect those students? So you have a long list of supports for your students. It's impressive. But if, if this list just resides on the list and your students aren't connecting to it, it doesn't matter. So how would you intentionally connect your students to the items on this list? Some of which you probably, I'm, I'm guessing if you're like most colleges, didn't even know that you had these supports in place for your students. Now you know, what are you going to do with it and how are you going to intentionally connect students to it? One thing we talked about was during our intake process, asking the questions that Sarah was talking about this morning to make sure we know before the crisis happens what potential barriers may exist. But the bulk of our conversation isn't really a how do we do it, but maybe more of a comment because we operate a lot on our satellite campuses and this paper full of supports is not available on those satellite campuses. And so we have to find a way to get our students here to access the services and that is not realistic for most of them. So we just wanted to put that out in the space too. As folks in their departments are thinking about how to intentionally connect students, we think a big part of that is presence on our satellite campuses. Really great, That's a great idea. really great insight. Back here and then we'll come to you. So what, what she said, for those in the back that couldn't hear, is the conversations have been happening about how we incorporate these services to our branch campuses, and they're gonna be rolling those out uh, and already having intentional conversations about that. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm an adjunct faculty member, and I, you know, I'm only barely aware of these uh, services that are available to students. And one of the questions that was asked, well, how do you get these spread out? And the answer is, is that you have to tell stories. So what you do is you create scenarios, and somehow you get to the faculty, and you say, okay, you're a faculty member, or some other you know, administrative staff, and what are you gonna do when some student comes to you and says, and tells you this, how are you gonna deal with it? Because I'm guessing most people are probably not thinking about this very much, but the way to get it in their heads is to get them to have to figure out what am I going to do? Deb Casey just told me, you know, teachers call her up and say, you know, what do I do in this situation? And the rest of the time, they don't think about it. But if you had these stories in your head and you knew what to do because you saw people playing out scenarios, then they'd remember them. Cool, that's helpful. And I think a challenge to your marketing team in the back. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yes. Yes, yep. please. <laughs> what you have to say is so important that we all want to hear it. Thanks for the support. <laughs> no, I actually text one of my coworkers to come and share, but she's working in the office. So I will do this. Um, my name is Basha. For those that do not know, I am a completion advisor here. And um, a part of our work in the Parkinson Completionist Center is also collaborating with the Benefits Hub. And so if you ever drop by Current Advising, all you have to do is come on in the back, and that's where we're located. Um, so there's a couple intentional ways we're trying to connect students to support. One would be, if you guys are familiar with our new student um, advising and registration orientations that we have, when students are signing up for those um, appointments, um, there's a questionnaire and usually they're self-identifying um, what resources that they need. So that's the first step when they're coming to college with that first quarter when they're coming to get their schedule they're able to identify if they need financial assistance if they need help with housing or if they need any type of um food support and those type of things so that's one way we're doing that um the second part that i mentioned to my group is the relational piece because i typically have people that walk students down to um to us or um they're giving me a call on the phone saying hey i'm sitting here with a student this is um, their situation, can you help them? And we kind of go from there. I would be asking you to tell us your email and your phone number because we're all gonna start calling you. I'll let you manage that on your own. Thank you so much, that was great. Hello? Yep. Is this working? You're up. Okay, um, one oh, look, thing that came up at back. our table is that this is written a lot in a you know, what we as staff and faculty can uh, provide for the student, but is there a version of this written for a student where they can see, you know, if they need help uh, with certain things, they can look down the list and say, this is what I need help with and how I can go and get it? Because I, I think we were thinking either maybe put it in the student handbook or online somewhere in like one list that can get, um, get access to it uh, would help them a lot as well. I think it's a fair question. I know your marketing team has already talked about, is talking about how you get that in the hands of students. Uh, so, so thank you for that suggestion. It's an important one. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. And I just uh, would like to share, we had a, an intentional moment on this very opening day. That is the first time all of these resources have ever been put together on a piece of paper and distributed to all faculty and staff at this college. The first time. So it's a step in the right direction. It is. I will just tell you to, to, to wrap up this portion of it. Uh, for us, that intentionality looks like um, integrating social services and the early alert that's easy for faculty and advisors uh, to tackle. It's the list of resources you have are integrated and are prominently talked about in our new student orientations in our first year seminar, 
and they're all a, a, a part of our new employee orientation, uh, which is a year-long process of becoming a part of the college. So communication and awareness is critical. I would say what we learned the first year when we emailed our list out to students is that having students read it in an email is different than having you walk them to the office and introducing them to the support staff and doing that relational handoff. Email's not gonna be the solution here. You've got to have intentional systems that connect your students relationally to these services because just because they're aware of it doesn't mean they're gonna use it. You are the ones that are gonna make sure they use it. Uh, thank you for the conversation and for allowing me uh, to be a part of your journey today. I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thank you, oh, you gotta hold on. And I wanna be mindful, thank you for being patient. We, we ran a little over today and I just, look, we, we, you all stayed. This is amazing, amazing. What a wonderful day to, to begin our year together. And you might be anticipating this, but uh, President Lowry Hart, would you give me the honor of giving you a gator pin for yes. a gator moment with us this so afternoon? So the Amarillo College or the Badgers? I think Badgers and Gators get along well, right? I think it's looking good for us. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'd let me do the honor. We are so honored to have had you here. It's been a pleasure. Thank I wish you so Sarah much. were here too. She's probably almost to Philadelphia at this point. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, My privilege. Thank you all today for sharing time and community. This was a big game buster professional development day for all of us. I think it's got us thinking about many things. I want to take you back to something I asked you all this morning. What would you attempt to do if you knew you would not fail? What would you attempt to do if you knew you would not fail? Green River, we will not fail striving to be the first choice in post-secondary education, the first choice in partnership with business and industry. We will not fail when we say we set a line in the sand and say we are doubling our completion in five to seven years and we will close equity gaps. We will not fail. We will not fail to achieve all students saying that they belong and that all students can name at least one person. And the reason I know we will not fail is because of you. Look at us. This is our 55th year. Happy birthday to us. We have such important work ahead of us. You are all the reasons that we will not fail, we will not fail our students. I welcome you all to reception following this. I'm looking forward to the rest of our week. Remember Thursday, two o'clock, our service award recipients, our distinguished faculty, as well as our outstanding staff awards. Please join us in this space Thursday, two o'clock. I know there's a lot going on tomorrow. Um, hope that some of you can stay for reception. I think you've probably got lots of things that you want to ask Russell about. I know where we can find him too, if you, if you want to hunt him down um, to ask him things. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for investing in us. Woo!